Good afternoon, this is uh, Steve Clark for Kawartha Lakes Alt Media and uh, we are just waiting in my barber shop for the arrival of Barry DeVolin for a short interview and um, as soon as he comes we will get underway and I hope you enjoy the interview. Uh, this is uh, February, sorry, March the 1st and I hope the snow doesn't slow down Barry. Okay, talk to you soon. Just try and do some, um, uh, just some alternate reporting on things that the media is naturally looking at. So, uh, anyways, today we have Barry DeVolin talking to us and um, the MP for uh, Halliburton Quarter Brock. And I was, actually, I read your bio in Wikipedia, and uh, I was actually amazed at your uh, your qualifications for the job. Oh. Uh, five years in poli sci. I'm surprised you must <laughs> stay awake that long. <laughs> well, I'm, I always say I'm one of the few that actually got a job in the field. So. Uh huh. So I was going to ask you, after 10 years of office, um, what would you say is probably your, your most, um, the thing you feel proudest about that you've done, uh, accomplished in this area? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think in terms of being the MP, it's like a lot of other jobs. There's kind of big issues that you're a part of, uh, long-term issues, and then there's small stuff, like dealing with individuals. I mean, mm -hmm. you're in the retail business, you deal with kind of one customer at a time as they come through here. And being an MP, that's the same. And I think when I got elected uh, about 10 years ago, the one thing I knew I could kind of control was constituent service, was the idea of, in terms of my office that's here in the riding, you know, uh, what staff would be there, what services that we would offer. Um, and so that's something that we really focused on. And uh, I feel like I have a great staff. And, you know, that's, that's an area, constituent service. Um, I'll give you an example. We have these passport clinics two or three times a year where we go around and help people through the application process. For most of us, that's pretty straightforward and people could do it themselves. But people that have blended families, that have adopted kids, people who have changed their names, uh, usually there's at least one or two people that show up at each of those clinics that it's very complicated. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they have a birth certificate that their name was misspelled on 50 years ago. Like, you'd be surprised at what we see. And often when we go through that process, you know, an hour or two later, that person will come up to me and want to shake my hand, and they'll look me straight in the eye and say, thanks so much, like, I've been kind of worried about this for years, and it's a, a little mess that needed to, to get cleaned up. And I'm so happy that we did this today, and thanks for doing this. So, you know, that's... Uh, when I look back, those little moments when people say, thank you for helping me deal with my kind of personal situation and solve this problem, it probably gives me more, probably gives me more pleasure than maybe some of the big stuff in terms of winning elections or forming government or voting on budgets or the big stuff. A, a lot of the little stuff gives, gives a lot of satisfaction. I wonder, could you tell me a bit about, uh, what was I reading about here, the Partisan Farm Council? That sounds kind of interesting. Uh... Or non-partisan. Oh, non sorry, non-partisan farm council. <laughs> well, you know, when I started running 10 years ago, uh, you kind of look at the riding. I mean, I'm from Halliburton, right? So this riding is fairly large. It includes Halliburton County, uh, Kawartha Lakes, uh, part of Peterborough County, kind of the northern part of Peterborough County, as well as Brock Township, kind of the Beaverton, Sunderland area. Um, if you just look at the ge geography or geology, kind of the edge of the Canadian Shield runs pretty much across the middle of this riding. So here in Bob Cajun, we're kind of sitting right on the edge. Mm -hmm. And from here north, it's a different economy than it is from here south. And farmers used to tease me when I was first running that, you know, we don't, they, they would say, we don't expect you to know anything about agriculture given that you're from Halliburton, right? So one of the things that I tried to do early on was to bring myself up to speed on a lot of those issues. Um, farming is complex, and if you talk to a beef producer, the issues that they're dealing with are not only different than a dairy producer has, but sometimes they're almost in conflict, but they're, but it's a very different rhythm. So, especially in the early years, the Farm Council was almost like a tutorial for me, that I would go and listen to local farmers tell me about the issues and things they were concerned about. But for me, it was also a learning opportunity just to get to the point, uh, you know, where I could sit in Ottawa and ask an intelligent question or listen to something that's, that's being said by the minister or by the government and be able to report that back. So I would say that um, that process was particularly important the first few years. Um, you know, I've, I've retained some of that information, so 
it's not as I'm not as far behind now as I was at that point. But it was it was a good process for me uh, to learn the file. And a great initiative too. And I can tell by your career path and um, I know that you're a family man that you have a real love of politics. And um, I was reading the other day that actually Canada's liberal dem democratic system is now the preferred uh, system you know, exported by the UN to countries that are struggling with democracy. And uh, seeing as you studied political science for so many years, what, what would you say is uh, the points about our liberal democracy that make it export worthy? Well, that's an interesting point. Um, we, don't, we don't often think of that, that the way that our government functions is kind of one system and that there actually are others available, right? Um, you know, we're, we're familiar with this in business that some places you go in, the people who work there are, are on a commission or another place they work for a salary or bonus or something. So it's the same in politics. And just to use an example, Canada, we have a British parliamentary, Westminster parliamentary system. Uh, in the United States, they have a Republican system that, uh, you know, is similar to what they would have in France. And I wouldn't say that one is better than the other. I would just say they function differently and, and in some situations our, our uh, system seems to work better than the Republican system. Some would argue the opposite. But I think that um, one of the really, I guess, wonderful things that we've seen in the last 50 years is the number of countries around the world that have embraced democracy and said this is the system that we want, this is the direction that we want to move, uh, has increased. Now it doesn't function perfectly everywhere and you know this month we're watching what's happening in the Ukraine uh, you know in terms of how is that democracy functioning, who's really in charge uh, in the Ukraine this month. Um, but um, through the United Nations and other organizations uh, there's often times when countries step up and basically say we're ready for a new constitution, we're ready for a new form of government. Uh, what are the options? And I think that uh, you know the flexibility of the parliamentary system that we have, it's fairly simple and straightforward. You know, just for example, the American system is far more complicated. You can mm -hmm. just try to understand how things work. And like many things, there's a certain beauty and simplicity that if people can understand it, they're more likely to support it. So I think it's uh, Canada is well regarded around the world. I mean. We think of ourselves as a very young country, which we are as a, as a country, we're young. But actually, as a democracy, we're very old. You know, we're approaching 150 years, and we had some amount of democracy in Canada before Confederation. So, uh, in terms of democracies around the world, we, we sit with the 10 or 20 countries that have been doing this for 150 years, and we're well respected. Uh, we have no colonial history in terms of us colonizing other countries. So. We don't have some of the baggage that maybe European countries would have. So it's it's a role that Canada plays, and I think it's, uh, and it's not over yet. In fact, I suspect in the next 10 or 20 years, um, it's going to be increasingly important that countries like Canada um, kind of explain how we do things and what works. I mean, it's, uh, democracy's not perfect in Canada. Our system doesn't work perfectly, but it works pretty well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's in, and in a sense, the fact that other countries want to emulate us, I would say, is proof of that. Uh, yeah, well, the article I was reading uh, was the, uh, you know, you see the simplicity that leaves the clarity of uh, the rights of the people, easy to see, uh, the transparency of government, uh, this kind of stuff, so you can actually, there is a, a dialogue between the public and the government about what is actually taking place. Um, anyway, I just want to change the subject, so <coughs> the reason I wanted to talk to you originally in this interview uh, down in your office was about the Canada-China FIPA. Mm -hmm. uh, now, has that been ratified yet at Council? Have the diplomatic envelopes been exchanged? Can you bring us up to speed on um, that? Well, FIPA is um, it's an agreement between Canada and China related to foreign investment. And um, Canada has agreements with countries around the world uh, for business reasons, sometimes to do with trade, sometimes to do with investment, sometimes to do with taxation issues. Uh, so there's not, we don't have the same kind of set of agreements with each and every country. It kind of varies from place to place. One of the challenges we've had over the years dealing with countries like China is that where, I mean, it's a, it's a one-party state. Uh, it's not democratic. It was a central command economy really until about 20 years ago what we think of as kind of the old communist economy. Uh, but they have actually moved towards a market economy 
but it's a different version of a market economy than we have. The government there still owns most of what exists in China, still have an enormous amount of control. And one of the uh, challenges that Canada, and I don't mean in this case the government of Canada, but investors, so whether it's uh, a company in Canada that actually wants to go to China to build a factory or to sell products into that country or, or Canadian banks that want to do business there, is kind of the expectation of what rights do they have in China. If something happens in China, you know, what legal rights do they have uh, compared to what legal rights they would have in Canada. So for example, if we're doing, if Canadians are doing business in the United States or Germany or Japan, there would be the expectation that those rights would be uh, protected in what you'd call kind of a normal way. Uh, when you're dealing with a country like China or Vietnam would be another example of the same. There's no history in that regard and um, if you're dealing with uh, a company in Germany, there's the company you're dealing with, but then there's the government. When you're dealing with China, the company and the government are kind of the same people. Uh, so the, the purpose of FIPA is to try to lay out rights that investors have moving in the two directions that, uh, I mean, Ch Chinese investors already enjoy most of those rights in Canada because we extend them to everybody, whether they're Canadian or foreign. Uh, the, from our perspective, the purpose of FIPA was to try to get uh, reciprocity that Canadian investors would have those same rights in China. And that's, that's what the FIPA was for. I, I, I should have researched this before I came to see it today to find it the, whether in fact that process is, is finalized or not. I mean, it's, it's in the process, and if it's not finalized yet, it will be. So I, don't, I think we're past the point where it's a question of whether it's going to happen or not. But I'm not exactly sure in terms of the paperwork where it's at. So I guess the question I bring to you from uh, some of the several meetings I've been to of uh, people like the Hapakasas tribe in uh, in uh, British Columbia there who have serious concerns about this is that not that trade is a bad thing, but that when China comes into our country to um, extract resources through companies like Nexon and Husky, for example, right. um, if we insist that they do things in an environmental fashion and they feel that they have lost perceived profits uh, they can then sue Canada as uh, Mobile Exxon did in New Brunswick I believe uh, for 300 million dollars for loss of perceived profits uh, and the arbitration process is that there's going to be three people only one of which will be from Canada and uh, we don't get to be in that meeting we don't get to hear the all the things that are being laid down on the table and we don't get to appeal that decision afterwards. Now, that would seem like a pretty tight column to be putting ourselves into. Well, I think that um, foreign... We have to separate what's... When we talk about something in Canada, whether it's a public entity or whether it's a private entity. So you mentioned um, Nexon, um, you know, private sector oil companies, for example, energy companies that exist in Canada whether they're being sold. Um, when we say they're Canadian, you know, there's a question of what does that mean? Like, is it actually owned by the government of Canada? Is it a, you know, private corporation that's owned in Canada? Uh, is it a public corporation? Um, you know, there's Sears Canada, but Sears Canada is 80% owned by Sears and Roebuck in Chicago, right? So, I mean, Sears Canada is a private company in Canada. But uh, you know, more than 90% of the ownership of that company actually isn't inside Canada. So I think sometimes these issues get a little oversimplified in terms of something, you know, the Chinese buying something in Canada. I think we need to understand um, what we're talking about, whether it's a private company that's based in Canada or whether it's something that is actually owned by Canadians. And I think that's an important issue. In terms of the rights that if, uh, and we dealt with this in the United States back with around the time of the free, treat, free trade agreement that if um, a foreign company wanted access to some resource or some contract in Canada and if the government of Canada decided for some non-economic, let's say environmental reason, could be a labor reason as well, uh, not to do something, if that causes financial injury to that, com to that company uh, should they have the right to compensation? Um, I mean, the shoe's on the other foot right now in the U.S. with the Keystone Pipeline. It's pretty clear. There's people who philosophically disagree with the Keystone Pipeline. But from a legal point of view, there's uh, if the American government 
chooses not to give it approval simply because they've chosen not to give it approval, you know, if a company in Canada has invested tens or hundreds of million dollars preparing for that, do they get compensation for that or not? So I think um, that's the issue we're grappling with. I don't see it as a, um, I, don't, I don't mean the word conspiracy, but I don't, there are those who believe that somehow Canada is, if not selling our soul, we're kind of selling our ability to control our own destiny. And I think um, for a hundred years we've had foreign companies uh, functioning in Canada and they have certain legal rights. And if the Canadian government chooses um, to make a policy that, that has a negative economic impact on a private company, uh, if it's a Canadian private company, it has the right to seek compensation if it's an American company or if it's a Chinese company. So I, I guess I don't see that FIPA or the way that we're dealing with China really is inconsistent with the way that we are dealing with uh, any other private interests in Canada, whether they're Canadian or foreign from somewhere else. I think the, the difference with uh, dealing with China is and has been this notion that it's not actually a private company from China that we're dealing with, it's actually the, the government of China that we're dealing with in that regard. And so um, there's, the, there's the concern that, um, that the government of China will somehow be able to lever that process to make Canadians either do things they don't want or force Canada to pay huge compensations. And I, I, I don't see it being that way. And um, I think that, uh, as I said, I don't think FIPA is outside the range of the typical agreements we have with many com countries. Uh, the only difference is for the first time, we're gonna have some parameters and some framework to deal with those issues with China. And in what Canada is looking for is some rights uh, on the other side, so that if Canadian companies are in China, and they build a factory there and suddenly the Chinese government decides to expropriate it or close it down for some reason that the Canadian company would have rights to compensation. Uh, the same the same idea in the opposite direction. Well, I'm just going to sort of flip to another topic here, but it's sort of uh, tied together. Uh, and I was fascinated to watch the Lac Megantic situation, the, de the train derailment. And, um, of course, you know, here we have a situation where uh, it was a different kind of oil that was being carried. There were some uh, safety issues. Uh, so the train basically torches a whole town in Canada, an American company. And the guy says, oh, sorry, I'm bankrupt. Figure it out. So all of a sudden, we, we have to, the insurance companies uh, have to cover a company's loss. But um, we, even, in, even with an American company, we don't seem to have any kind of control over, I mean, I think it's outrageous that this... So how would that, and I mean it was a tragedy obviously, I don't think anybody uh, sees that horrible situation as anything less than a tragedy, uh, whether there were rules bro broken in terms of what was in the train, you know, that shouldn't have been there, whether the, whether the cargo was uh, forbidden or whether the safety regulations are around the trains. I guess. The only way I would turn the question uh, and ask it a slightly different way is, so if if the rail company had been owned in Canada, how, if it had been, I mean we have short line rail companies all across Canada, so if this had been a short line rail company that was Canadian owned and exactly the same thing had happened, how would that be any different? Because your question is kind of implicitly somewhat because it was an American company that that's particularly bad and I don't understand how if it had been a Canadian short haul rail company that it that anything would be any different uh, I think because if it was a Canadian company uh, we have some regulations in place to you know maintain track safety uh, rolling stock safety uh, there is some kind of accountability ability and answerability whereas I understand under the FIPA say, say if this was under the FIPA agreement and China owned that railroad line and we insisted that they make that line safer or those cars safer they could say, well, hey, you're cutting into our profits. You have to pay us something to do that. But I don't think, I'm not sure I agree with that interpretation. I mean, there are issues, there are questions being asked and issues around rail safety, right? Like whether the track had been maintained properly. But I mean, there's been derailments in Western Canada with Canadian railways on other Canadian tracks. So that's not unique. I guess I'm trying to disentangle whether the fact that the railway 
is owned by an American company actually makes any difference. And I think the issue around standards, whether trains like that ought to be able to go through towns, whether the rails are kept up to a standard. I mean, the government of Canada sets safety standards. I, I think there's a legitimate question, A, are the, are the standards sufficient, and B, are they being enforced? But I don't think either one of those issues change based on who owns the railway. And I think, again, I'll go back to NAFTA, which was, I, I remember when NAFTA was signed, and Maud Barlow and others at the time saying it was the end of the world as we knew it, that water was going to be exported out of Canada and, and that we were losing control and all these foreign companies would have all these rights. At the time, I think, I thought at the time it was kind of shrill uh, rhetoric and I think, you know, 20 years later it's proven to be unfounded. I think th there are legitimate questions to be asked, but I think the, the suggestion that somehow by Canada inter entering into international relationships where Canadian companies have rights in their country similar to their own companies and that foreign companies have rights in Canada similar to Canadian companies that somehow that's going to lead to a situation where we somehow lose our sovereignty or that other countries or other companies can force these things on Canada. I, I just I hear all this talk but I actually don't see uh, any proof that this is happening and you know I think it's We are one sovereign state called Canada. There's private capital, whether individuals like you and I hold it or whether companies have it. It's a global economy. Um, you know, even lots of large companies today, like, you know, if you say, who is that company, Canadian or American? I, there's different ways to answer that. Where it's their head office versus where are most of their shareholders versus where does most of the activity take place? Um, I think that's the reality of the world today. And I think what our government's doing and this is no different than the governments before it is trying to figure out a way to make that work for Canada so that you know we can prosper which sometimes means helping our companies do business abroad that creates work in Canada and wealth here and also um, creates a, a situation where foreign companies are comfortable coming into Canada uh, to do business here because they fear that they will be treated fairly and the same as Canadian companies and not differently by government. So I think that's where this goes and and uh, as I said I I think the concern that somehow this puts us in a place where we never were before is is not true and in the past the the dire predictions of of, of like I say others being able to tell Canada what to do I don't think is has happened so I, I I'm not sure that it's well founded in this case either. So, uh, just one final question on, on this topic. Uh, I have actually researched quite a bit on the computer to try and find the FIPRA, Canada China FIPRA agreement, and I can't seem to source it anywhere. Could you tell us where to locate that document so we can actually see um, you know, if there is accountability? In, cause it's, not, it's not the contract side of it, the call, or dealings with foreign countries, that is the issue. Uh, it's like in my store here, I'm accountable. You know, I have health. Uh, nurses come around to make sure. sure that I'm living up to certain standards and so on and so forth because I have direct connection with the public. Well, that's pretty transparent. Like you can see those rules and regulations and what my accountability is in this situation. But yet, I, I can't seem to find where I can read the accountability written into the FIPA document. Well, I, I mean, I don't obviously have it with me, but or uh, but I can certainly uh, get you. Um, that uh, a copy of the FIPA so that you can see it yourself. I, I mean, I haven't seen the actual document myself. I'm sure it's hundreds of pages long, but if that's something you'd like, I'm sure that, uh, you know, I can get it for you. I would love to have a quick scan through that. Well, thank you for coming out on a very snowy day and having a little chat with us. And, uh, and please do have a conversation with you.